for those of you who might think that Linux and GNU and free software has a lot to do with like very dogmatic uh, hippies, which have like a very strong political agenda, this image was diluted to a certain extent by the open source initiative. And you might think that this is a great thing or a bad thing, but in the end, Nowadays, due to the efforts of the open source initiative to make these concepts more palatable to the commercial world, very many very big companies use free and open source in their business model. IBM, Google, Oracle, but so many more. Uh, there are, of course, companies which are based entirely on free and open source, but these companies aren't, though they use it very intensely. So the commercial world has recognized for a very long time that free and open source software is great. And they do use it internally, and they also do develop it. Uh, sometimes they want to sell other things to people, just so that they are in a position of more power and making more money. But I think with time, this, this is starting to fade, uh, and better business models are starting to develop. All of this owing in the, in the incipient phase to the open source initiative. Uh, in the end, like I might have presented this contrast, like this sort of schism in the free and open source world, but for most pragmatic reasons and purposes, they work together. So people have been interviewed on both sides of the argument, and generally they, they agree on most issues on what has to be done, which is why we generally use the moniker free and open source software. Some people say free and or open source software, just to refer to the fact that although these people might tick differently in their heads, uh, what they end up doing in the com on the computer in the end is very often quite close to each other. Uh, the way in which you can flag a piece of software as free and open source is licensing. Yeah? So generally, when you write a piece of software, you automatically have a copyright on it. Yeah? Uh, if you want to make it free, you could think of releasing it in the public domain, like not having a license, but that has a lot of problems because in some, some jurisdictions you might not be allowed to do that, or that might make you liable if the software like breaks anything, or, or it might allow people to like just take the software, change a tiny bit about it, and, and make it proprietary again. So the public domain has a number of drawbacks. It would be the simplest, most intuitive way to go about this, but generally if you want to make sure that software is free and open source, you license it. And the most prominent license in the free and open source world is the GPL license. It is a license made by the Free Software Foundation, Actually, it is a series of licenses they update it from time to time to make sure that it's, it faces the current challenges to freedom which, which the modern world poses. And generally, they are based on the four freedoms, which I told you before. And the license, of course, is a very, very long legal document. But the main bullet points, like summarized shortly, are that the GPL license, the moment you put a product under the GPL license, you grant it to others, you're still the owner, but you guarantee to others that they have the program, uh, that they have the freedom to run the program as they wish for any purpose. Yeah? Very often, in very, many in very many pieces of proprietary software, you are not allowed to do whatever you want with the software. You are allowed in the free software world. It gives people the freedom to study how the program works and to change it so it does their computing as they wish. That's another problem I mentioned earlier, namely that with proprietary software, you get a binary. You can't really modify it, and in many cases, you're also not really allowed to modify it. In the free software world, you are. So if you get a piece of free software, you can study it, and you can modify it so that it does exactly what you want. You also get the freedom to redistribute copies so you can help your neighbor. So if some, somebody else wants the software, you can just give it to him. Yeah? And the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions, which I think is basically the pinnacle of these points. So you get a piece of software. You see how to make it better. You can make it better, and you can give it to your neighbor. right? And you might think that this doesn't really apply to you if you're not a programmer, but in fact, it does. And we'll get to that a bit later. Um, the next license, the BST license, is more from, so to say, the open source initiative corner of the movement. And it's very minimalistic. Basically, the BSD license is like an improved version of the public domain in which it protects you from liability. So these are the three clauses of the, of the BSD license. BSD, BSD stands for the Berkeley Software Distribution, which was the, uh, the first piece of software licensed under this license. And uh, as you can see, the first two causes mainly are there to like, preserve the continuity of the license, to make sure that people can't just stick another license on it. And the last one is the important one. It, it's a point which protects you against liability. So basically, if you license your code as BSD, yeah, 
you say, okay, you can use this for whatever you want, you can distribute it in whatever fashion you want, but you cannot hold me liable if it does something which it's not supposed to do. It's, so to say, one of the freest licenses in the sense that people who use your product have very little obligations, actually close to none. And there can be addendums to it. For instance, there is BSD with attribution, where people who use it or distribute it also have to attribute the original author. But generally, this is a much looser license than the GPL. And you might think it's better simply because it's smaller, it's more loose, or you might think it's worse simply because it doesn't guarantee the perpetuation of freedom in the same way in which the GPL does. And this brings us to our next, next big concept, which is, hmm? no? Okay, which is copyleft. Copyleft is not a license per se, it's a category in which very many open source licenses and open source products can fall, yeah? Uh, it's a concept which, for instance, is represented in the GPL, the first license I talked to you about from the Free Software Foundation, but not in, BSD, in the BSD license. Yeah? And it means that if a product is licensed under a copyleft license, whichever that might be, that product is committed to stay forever free. You cannot redistribute it and no longer give the freedoms to people. You have an obligation to stick to the freedom part. Yeah? This is what's called viral licensing, because it's supposed to spread and there is no going back. Uh, it also restricts sometimes interaction with non-free programs, for instance, library linking. That's, that's a big issue if you're interested in more of the technical side of it. Uh, and generally, this is a concept which kind of splits people, because in a way, saying that your product has for should forever maintain the freedoms which at the beginning get granted to people. It's like saying, okay, we commit to this model of free and open source software, and we are absolutely, entirely, 100% sure that it will be able to address all problems we might ever have better than a proprietary format or, or a format which distributes less freedoms or, or has less obligations. In a way, it guarantees you freedom, but it's a bit like locking yourself outside of jail. And you might think, well, okay, that's good, I'm outside of jail, uh, but can you really be sure that you're never going to want to go back in there, like, look what it's like, and maybe, I don't know. That's the thing, you make a very strong commitment to the fact that freedom is not a tool which happens to be useful now, but freedom is a sort of god which will forever dominate uh, the way in which software should be handled. Uh, some people find it problematic, and to give you an example of how this can spread and it can actually force you to forever stay in this environment, if you ever want to share anything from my presentation, you will have to make it completely free. Why? Because from all of the things I've shared with you, this picture back here, it's licensed under the Creative Commons, uh, Commons by, so attribution, share-alike license. Share-alike means that all derivatives of this work have to be shared under the same license. So my entire presentation has to be shared under a copyleft license. So if you want to share any other bit of this presentation as well, not just this picture, you will also have to use a copyleft license. This is how viral, viral licensing works, and this is why many people don't, aren't that comfortable with it and think it could become dangerous. So I hope I gave you like a rough impression of what uh, free and open source software is and like the legal and moral concepts which lie behind it. But of course, if you're here curious uh, about how you can integrate all of this in your lives, if you're curious about using Linux or more free and open source tools, uh, you want to know what the advantages are, right? Like very many of these things sounded like, okay, maybe they're useful for programmers, but what do you as a user who might also become a programmer or be one, uh, get if you use free and open source software. Uh, the first thing which you get is performance. Uh, there is this sort of mantra of the free and open source world called Linus laws, and of course there have been studies trying to prove it, and, and some have, some haven't, uh, that given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. So the point of this law, this mantra, is that in an environment where only very few people from one company can review the source code, it is much more difficult to identify and fix bugs than in an environment where everybody can see the code. Yeah? More people looking, more things being seen, which is why very many people believe, uh, and there's data to support this, that free and open source software does tend to have less bugs than proprietary software. So you will tend to experience less crashes. You will tend to have increased performance, especially for older hardware, because in older hardware there's been more time to like review everything, and maybe sometimes like the proprietary drivers have been able to be replaced by free and open source drivers. 
Uh, and of course, lots of proprietary software nowadays has a lot of services which you might not necessarily want running in the background. They, they take up memory, they waste your resources. Generally, you do get better performance with free and open source software. And if everything should still fail, if all of these advantages fail to materialize, if you still get a bug or a crash, you do get so much better support. This refers to both community support, simply because the community of developers is interested in their software being used, in them getting validation and recognition for that, and they will be able to provide you directly with competent help. You will not pick up the phone and, and get to talk to someone who has a flowchart and goes through the flowchart with you, and most of the flowchart assumes that you're incompetent simply because many people don't have that much insight into software, but you will be able to talk to the people who are most experienced about the software because they're part of a community, right? They're not hidden behind a company. Also, if you're like a company, and you're using the product or just a person who is willing to pay for support, which I, I guess most of you wouldn't, but this is a very big advantage, actually. With proprietary software, support is a monopoly. This is why the free support which you get is very bad, and the paid support which you get is also quite bad, but it's also very expensive, simply because you are forced to go for all of your support needs to this one company. There is no alternative, or very seldomly, and not that many. Whereas here, since everybody can see the code, support is a free market. There is real competition. That's why you do get very good support. And even when you have to pay for it to get the absolute best support, it's often not as expensive as if you would require it from, from, a, soft, or from a company distribute, uh, distributing software around a proprietary model. Uh, another big advantage is, of course, education. You're, many of you are still students, and uh, by having insight into the software, you can become smarter and more creative. What I mean by this is you can understand in the limit of your interest and of your technical ca capabilities what the software does. And with time, your technical capabilities will grow simply because by random, over time, you will be curious, well, what does this actually do? And you will be able to find out. And then you might have more questions. You might unwittingly end up becoming someone who is very good with computers. So actually, very many people might worry about the fact that, OK, Linux and free software is just for people who are like very good with computers, programmers, and so on. Actually, the inverse is true to a certain extent. Once you do start using Linux and free and open source software, it's not that you will have to become proficient with computers to use it, but it will be so easy for you to become proficient that very often you will end up doing just that. You will be able to learn valuable, transferable skills in the sense that you will understand how a computer works and what exactly it can do. Very often when you do computer work and you write on your resume, well, I can work in Excel, what you're actually saying is, my skill is that I have learned the, a very complex and high-level interface which some interface designer thought was useful. That might be a good skill which will help you solve some problems, but it's not really transferable, right? Because unless other products have the same user interface concept as Excel, you won't be able to use that in new contexts. But by being able to understand more about the computer and having more transparency in the programs which you use, you will have skills which allow you to deal with any sort of program which is on a computer. You will be able to like query many files at once for a certain string, look for patterns, replace patterns, uh, have skills which are ap applicable in many more contexts than just knowing one particular user interface. And of course, you will get better software habits. Yeah? Uh, you might ask yourselves, why am I using XYZ software? Why? And the answer is, well, because some, someone I've worked with is using it, uh, I've been taught about it in school, or my university, that's my favorite one, this is how, how the proprietary software world gets you hooked, or my university and school has a contract by which they can offer me proprietary software for free, so I end up learning their user interfaces, I get stuck in that system, and once I'm out, I have to pay for it as well. Then again, ask yourselves, why a programmer, someone who is making free and open source software, is using a tool. Very likely, it's because they have looked at very many different tools and they have come to the conclusion that this one does the job in the best fashion. This is the best tool, right? And if you work in an environment which is strongly, where these people have a very strong presence and they talk to you and they advise you, you will end up get, uh, using tools which are objectively better, which are superior, which are more sustainable, which allow you to do more things in less time. Yeah? 
So people who use specialized computer tools, for instance, LaTeX instead of Word or Git for version tracking, for instance, you might do your version tracking without any piece of software. You might have like a folder where you write your master thesis and you have master thesis one, master thesis two, master thesis final version, master thesis final version two, and so on. Um, there's a system to do that in a considerably better way using considerably less space and also in the end being considerably faster. But you wouldn't know about it. I mean, some of you might, but if you spend time without any contact with the free and open source world, just trapped in this proprietary environment of, okay, Windows, a bit of Microsoft, a bit of Adobe, a bit of MathWorks, then you might not find out about that. And a lot of possibilities will seem quite opaque to you. Uh, another big advantage which you would get is empowerment. I've talked about this at the beginning, and I've mentioned it a few times. You do get something like a vendor lock-in, right? You rely on a company for support. You have like a set environment of tools which, the, which certain companies were able to like imprint on the university environment and so on. And you would not have that anymore. You would be able to seamlessly switch between pieces of software, uh, depending on which one's best. You won't make any big commitment by buying a license. Right? You will be able to get the software directly for free from the source, which is usually distributing it for free because they want you to use it and to get, receive your feedback. Um, and you will be free of any constraints in that sense on your usage of the computer. You would also get control over any, any service running on your system. If the entire system is transparent and you can see what's going on behind the scenes and you can modify what's going on behind the scenes, if you can like edit the source, recompile, and then have a new binary, or if other people can do it, or if you can pay people to do it, none of which, by the way, you can do with proprietary software, then you can control everything that's going on on your computer. And this can be as banal as that, that like pop-up which comes up, do you want to update Microsoft Windows, or your Microsoft Windows key has expired and whatnot. Uh, th those are things built by companies inside your computer so that it's difficult for you to stop them. There is no such thing in a free and open source environment. You can control everything that's happening on the machine simply because you have physical access to the machine. And you never have to ask for permission. You have your machine, you have your code, if all of it is free and open source, you go modify it, redistribute it. You never have to worry about obtaining any permission in advance or any legalese or talking to lawyers simply because this makes the entire development and usage pro process much more seamless. Innovation is, is a really big thing, and it's, of course, what made free and open source software so good and so popular. By getting better software habits, by incrementally learning more bits and pieces about how a computer works, you will become more productive. You will be able to address new questions, and you will be able to address old questions in ways which are more creative or more efficient. Yeah? And the second point, I think, is very valuable you will end up having more freedom than on the free market. If you, look at your, um, if you look at your technological products, which you own, like the results of advancement and development, and you look on the branding, it will very probably not say a Bundesministerium für Computerherstellung, right? It might say the name of a company. Why is that? Simply because companies tend to have more competition between them and less overhead. They can develop things faster and more efficiently. But what if we go one step further? Because companies still have a lot of regulation, they still have a lot of overhead. But what if you could compete at a more fundamental level than products and companies? What if you could compete at the level of ideas, of code commit? This is what's happening in the free and open source world, and this is what leads to the products becoming so much better, so much faster, and in, in fact to companies using them underneath the hood, like maintaining their corporate identities for the product and the branding, but actually using quite a bit of free and open source software on your mobile phone, simply because the development does give you the most freedom of all the development models, which of course allows you to be very innovative and very rapid in your work. Security is a very big point, and um, <clears throat> one which you might have heard a lot about in, in like the past years and also recently, simply because there is this, uh, I'd say a bit more than fear, there is this growing certainty that very many institutions, governments, but also others might have the possibility, the means, the interest to spy on you or to take control of your devices and might actually even be doing so, right? Uh, this is in part due to exploits, which are bugs, 
which could technically be better fixed in a free and open source environment, but also due to proprietary uh, software having like backdoors, sending your data quietly to some point. These are things which are much more easily prevented in free and open source software. In a free and open source project, any bit of code which would pipe your data to some undisclosed destination would not be able to survive simply because it belongs to the community, right? Where would it send that data to? It would be easy to spot and people would be, ver would be very happy and interested to prevent that. Uh, and you might, you might say that you're not that worried about privacy and I know it's a like, common standpoint, some, one which I also sometimes have. Uh, but I think the, the last years, and I don't know if you're very uh, up to date with like the latest developments from WikiLeaks and the last bit of leaks on the CIA, uh, very many people might have been thinking, well, it doesn't really matter, the government is spying on me anyway, and very many other people might have thought, well, okay, it's going to sort itself out, right? But the last set of information we got on this actually indicates that the problem hasn't become any bit smaller, if anything, it's become quite a bit worse. And even if you're not concerned about the privacy, even if you say, I don't have anything to hide, which for many of you might even be the case, uh, then think about it. With time, computers will not only have like read access to your lives via the camera and the microphone, they will also have write access to your lives because you will depend more on computers for driving you around, sorting your information, and I think that's where it really becomes problematic. I think you can say, well, I don't have anything to hide, but what you can say is, I don't have anything to lose, which is why it's a twofold advantage. It's security and stability. Free and open source software can fix exploits faster, and free and open source software is very unsuitable for any backdoors. I think you had a question? But isn't it like easier to find exploits if you have the source code? It might be a bit easier, but it's also going to be a lot easier to contract and detect and fix those exploits. If you have the source code in a company, especially if you're, government and you have, you're a government and you have leverage over them, it's very easy to introduce exploits and introduce backdoors. The model which you're talking about on a free and open source project is there is an exploit which mi might be more easily detected simply because the code is visible, but then on top of that, you have to count the probability of the people detecting it wanting to break the pro project and not wanting to fix it. Most people who read the source code are people who develop the project who have each and every interest in making it great and not in making it bad. So the probability of finding an exploit is higher, but then again, the probability that this will lead to a, fi to a fix is also a lot higher. It is a bit of a two-edged sword, but experience indicates that um, it's a lot easier to get rid of exploits in free and open source software. Also, once an exploit has become known, as, has become, as is the fact with like, the most recent set of leaks, which actually exposed quite a bit of exploits, it's, very, it's so much easier to check whether it was also fixed. Right? Because very many companies, I heard that there was a tweet from Apple or whatever, maybe I was misinformed, that they said, okay, we've taken care of everything. Well, maybe they have, but how would you know? No? And it goes beyond that, right? You use software which is more transparent and which is thus trustworthy. Trustworthy in the same sense in which you want a government to be trustworthy. Software has increasingly much, uh, increasing, uh, an increasing amount of power over your life, so you want to be able to trust it, and you can only do it if it's transparent. If you or other people who are better informed than you but who you trust, can review the software and can be informed on what it does. In a company, the, in, in a proprietary software model, the people who review it are inside the company, right? Maybe you trust them so much that you say it's okay, but, but maybe you don't, right? Um, and of course, with free and open source software, you have access to better encryption simply because by definition, most encryption standards are like developed in a quasi-academic environment. They are reviewed by academics, they are reviewed by governments. So simply by definition, encryption standards have to be free and open source. Because if your encryption standard does something which, uh, if you don't know exactly how the encryption works, right, then in order to trust that, you would need to have utter and complete trust in the company which is selling this model to you. That, that's not an encryption model which will do very well. All popular encryption models are free and open source simply because you need to have insight in how, into how it works to be able to determine that it actually works. Uh, another big aspect and a big advantage of free and open source software is sustainability. It's uh, an argument which is very important to us, the alternative. 
And uh, sustainability might have some connotations which don't, don't entirely apply to this year, right? You might think of sustainability like feeling better about what you're doing because you've planted a tree or you've bought some organic product and averted the apocalypse and so on. This is a bit different than that, but it's still sustainability. Unlike any material good, human knowledge realistically has the potential to stay with us forever, right? And it's very important to reposit it, distribute it in such a way that it will never be lost, that the collective knowledge of mankind will never get to a level which is lower than what we have now, that the absolute worst case scenario is that we stay just as smart, right? And in order to do that, you need to put the software, which in the meantime has, has come to represent a huge part of human knowledge, human ideas about problem solving, implementation of mathematical algorithms, and so on, to put it in a form in which it can stay, in, in, in which it can stay available forever. Free and open source software depends on no single entity for its continuity. Proprietary software, the code for it is reposited by, by a big company and they're like secure servers. If something happens to that company, some calamity or simply some legal troubles, that can also be a big factor, then that code, that knowledge which has gone into solving problems via a piece of software uh, will be lost forever and for everybody. Whereas with free and open source software, it's public. It can be reposited by everybody and it is reposited by many people. Uh, it is so much more difficult to lose it. Not least of all, it can always be improved, but never be made worse. Of course, there should be an asterisk next to that. If it, of course, can be made worse if the community as a as, um, collective makes bad decisions. Uh, but simply because free and open source software is often version controlled and so on, any modifications can be reverted. And like the state of the software can only progress. And the software can go into disuse only if it fails to perform, right? There are no legal hurdles or material hurdles, hurdles to the continuations of these projects. The only problems which they might ever encounter is that they no longer perform well. Uh, this is a much better way to address issues and a much better way to hold a product to some standards than relying on complex legal systems. Uh, not least of all, the software is reproducible and transparent. You notice I say transparent again. I said it in the last slides where I talked about transparent as in government. Here I mean transparent as in science. I mean comprehensible. People can learn about the software and understand what it does and have access to the knowledge represented in, in the code. Uh, and of course, it's reproducible. As I've told you before, software is usually executed as a binary and turned from source code into a binary by a process called compilation, right? You want to make sure that the binary which you get wasn't edited for, for trust, security, but, but also simply for performance reasons, right? And if the code is available, then you can make sure that the software is reproducible. If the code is not available, then of course you can't. Um, a couple of examples of popular free and open source software which exhibit these advantages I've listed to you uh, are, for instance, the Linux kernel. Many of you know the operating system, the main operating system in the free software world as Linux. Linux is the name of a kernel, which is a bit of software which simply distributes resources for other programs. It's very fundamental and very important for any computer. Uh, every computer has one. Linux is the name of the, of the kernel used by GNU Linux distributions, such as Ubuntu, Debian, Gentoo, Mint, and so on. And it was developed by uh, Linus Torvalds at the University of Helsinki in 1991. Um, Linus Torvalds wa was a very good coder, continues to be one, but the success of this kernel is based as much, if not a lot more, on, free, on the free and open source world than on Linus' own competence. If you look at the percentage of the code now, which he has written himself, it's vastly, vastly under a quarter. I think it's in the single digits, though I don't know the numbers exactly, right? The product has become so good simply because people had access to it, could make it better, and could distribute it back to the community. This was the main advantage. This is what helped Linux become such a huge thing. Uh, the backbone which Linux used for, for the operating systems, the associated programs for the kernel, uh, are usually developed by the Free Software Foundation, like very many of them, as, as, at least in the incipient phase, uh, which is why some people tend to call these operating systems GNU Linux operating systems. Long before the Linux kernel came around, the, the GNU, um, 
how do you call it, the GNU movement. Uh, no. Uh, GNU stands for GNU is not Unix, and it was, so to say, the, the software brand of the people of the Free Software Foundation. And they started developing a lot of pieces which you would need to create an operating system, like a compiler, which turns source code in, in C mainly uh, into machine-readable code, a lot of uh, desktop applications, for instance, the GNOME suite, and, of course, uh, very, very many other applications. Octave does numerical computing, GNU Cache does, does finance management. They tried to create an entire environment. And they were also working on a kernel, but it just turned out that the Linux kernel grew up faster, was better performing, so they just plugged that in. So generally, the, mo the most operating systems which you might end up using uh, after the Linux days are GNU Linux operating systems. Uh, in the sense that they use the Linux kernel and they use a GNU environment to provide like the basic or even more advanced uh, features which you would be expecting in an operating system. But there's of course so much more than just this. Yeah, The environment is highly suitable for developing projects, which is why if you would ask the question, well, can I do what, what I do on Windows or, or Mac or whatever you use in the free and open source world? The answer is almost always yes. But if you ask the inverse question, well, can I do with proprietary software everything which I can do with free software? Then the answer becomes no quite a bit more often, simply because it's so much easier to get a free software project started it might, not be, uh, it might not make a lot of money at the beginning, but it doesn't rely on that. It relies on garnering enthousi enthusiasm in order to grow. Um, you get a lot of applications for the desktop. For instance, you all know the Chromium browser. You might be using Google Chrome's version of it. You might know everybody's second favorite browser, Firefox. Uh, you might know LibreOffice, which is like a free and open source um, replacement, so to say, analog of the Office suite. It's a very good example of free and open source software jumping into the slots, uh, like trying to mimic proprietary software simply in order to give you the possibility to do whatever you can do in the proprietary world in the free and software world. It's a very close, so to say, um, approximation. It provides closely the same functionalities as a normal office suite. Uh, but of course, I've talked to you earlier about getting better software habits. And using free and open source software is very often about that. So LibreOffice is something which you can do in the free and open source world, but actually something which you shouldn't do in the free and open source world, because Office suites have very high level interfaces, are quite complex, and actually don't allow you to address the problems which you want to do by like typesetting a document better than, for instance, LaTeX, right? LaTeX is what you should be doing to create documents. And of course, you can do that. If you want to do LaTeX in a proprietary environment, that's when you get a problem. But if you say, OK, I'm too entrenched in my software habits evolving from like Microsoft Office, I can't make the big leap to using a completely different document, document creation system, then you can still do this, right? So ju just to state it again, the arrow goes in both ways, but it goes more often in the sense in which you are able to do the things which proprietary software allows you to do in the free and open source world than vice versa. You have numerous multimedia players. You have MPV, which is a very minimalistic but very powerful video player. Uh, MPD, which is a music player daemon. For instance, I listen to music on my phone, which is streaming from my server at home, meaning that I have access to a lot of music, uh, all of that without having to rely on any proprietary cloud subscription software and, of course, without having to pay anything for it. Um, you also have other players such as VLC. G GMPC is a client for the music player server. It's something which I use on my laptop to, use to listen to the music which is playing back home while I'm at work. Uh, you have very many scientific applications. Actually, this is a big front where you have a lot more possibilities and a lot more features in the free and open source world than the proprietary software world. Uh, NumPy is a very powerful uh, set of libraries for numerical processing in Python. Uh, Matplotlib is a plotting library also in Python. NiPipe is a set of interfaces which allow you to use very many different, very many different um, toolkits and, and other applications for brain imaging and uh, neuroscientific data processing from a Python environment. Uh, Jabref is a manager for your references. Uh, R is a statistical analysis package. 
Uh, so for instance, if you're, if you're using MATLAB in your studies and you're wondering, well, can I do the same things I can do with MATLAB with free and open source software? Then the answer is definitely yes, but you can do so much more simply because the Python environment is so much more easily extensible, so much more powerful, and unlike the MATLAB scripting language, it is actually a programming language. It has a lot of functionalities which are not scientific by definition, but which can be very useful for your science. Now, I have a question for you. It's officially break time. Do you guys want to take a break? No? Okay, I'll take your word for it. No break it is. Um, yeah. Server cloud applications, this is a very big front for free and open source software simply because very many people who run servers want to make sure that they are secure, that they are performing well. So you'll see in some of the next slides, that's, that's one of the areas of software usage where free and open source software has a very big market share, so to say. Uh, if you're interested in graphics processing, for instance, I, I like to do photography and post-process my images, you can do that as well. You can use raw therapy for for processing, you could say that this is an alternative to, to Lightroom. You can use GIMP if you want to do like raster imaging processes where you like selectively edit bits of your image. You could say that this is an alternative to Photoshop. Inkscape for drawing vector graphics. You could say that this is an alternative to, what's the proprietary version of Inkscape? Something like Corel Draw, I think. I don't even know if they make Corel Draw anymore. Um, and of course, so much more. If you have questions about any particular application, you can of course ask them at the end of the course and we'll be happy to tell you more about that. Uh, so now you've gotten a good idea of what free and open source software is, what the advantages are, what a couple of the very, very many examples are, but you might also want to know who uses it. So in wh what club am I joining if I'm starting to use free and open source software? Uh, and the club you are joining is the club of all people who actually care about computers performing. Uh, the internet is one of the biggest users of free and open source software. In this pie chart, you can see with green uh, the web servers which are free and open source, and with red, those which aren't, with blue a category which includes both, right? So if you look at the market share for web servers, these are basically the pieces of software which allow a computer to serve content to the internet, you will notice that the vast majority is free and open source. The same happens if you look at the operating system, so the base operating system, right, uh, on computers which run websites. This is, this is different from the, from, the web, uh, from the web server simply because you can put different web servers on, on different computers, right? Uh, but again, here you see that Unix, again, dominates the market. This is no coincidence. This is simply because people who run servers want them to be under their control. They want to be able to hire support teams from wherever they want or have their own in-house support teams, which is something you, you cannot do with proprietary software. They care about security and they care about efficiency. So when push comes to shove, people tend to end up using free and open source software because it delivers. Uh, public institutions. Public institutions might be a lot more concerned, like also concerned with efficiency, but perhaps even more concerned with like the effects that this has on the macroeconomics or on the social spirit or or on how, so to say, the freedom of their citizens is preserved. So very many governments, when they set up um, computers, so to say, for, um, for their officials and so on, might be very interested in looking at free and open source software. First of all, it gives them a strategic benefit. A big problem with using proprietary software, especially if your government is not the US American government, is that your government will end up depending on foreign companies for their software infrastructure. It might seem like, okay, well, we're all getting along, so why should we worry? We're all friends with the US, right? Well, again, I I even if you believe that, like the, the amount of leaks which recently came out might make you wonder, well, how good friends are they with us, right? And uh, for other governments which are not in the Western Hemisphere, this problem becomes even greater, right? Like if you know that there is a conflict of interest between you and a group of people which is closely associated with a group of people which is making your software, then you will not want to rely on them. You will want to have software which is free, which is open source, which we can, you can hire people to modify, and which you always know what it is doing. 
It also has economic benefits simply because of the huge ramifications of free and open source software for um, innovation, right? I told you, if you are using free and open source software, and from a government's point of view, if your population is using free and open source software, your population is becoming more computer literate. They are having more transferable skills. They are able to develop more products, which are highly performing. They are able to create more companies, which provide services, which are highly performing. It is very much in the interest of a government for their population to use free and open source software and to be familiar with how it works, to have the power, the control, and the knowledge. And the last one also spells out the social benefits associated for a society using free and open source software, especially if you're like in a democratic nation, you rely on your population for intelligent, good decision making, right? Especially if you're a country which has a lot of referendums, right? And the more technical the world gets, the more complicated the questions which people will have to answer are the more crucial it is that people get an insight into how software works. The more crucial it is that when people read a leak from WikiLeaks saying something about the weaknesses of like different platforms and so on, they are able to have an informed opinion about that, rather than saying, well, I don't really understand any of this, and someone said this is all like a Russian hoax, so I'm just going to believe that, right? So it's very important for your people to have insight in what's happening in the modern world. And very often what's happening in the modern world is software. Uh, a couple of examples more closely related to you might be the ETH and the University of Zurich. Uh, the ETH has a Linux cluster running CentOS, which is a free and open source operating system. And they have also Fedora and dual boot on most of their public computers. Uh, the University of Zurich has a very interesting product, like an open stack based cluster, which is a very good example of how free and open source software can work commercially. OpenStack is a free and open source software, which is a, is a piece of free and open source software which is sold by Red Hat, and it's sold under a sub subscription model. Basically, you want that piece of software, they give it to you, it's free anyway, so you could redistribute it, but by paying a subscription, you get support and you can ask them to put features inside which you want, right? A group of people at the University of Zurich have done just that. They have bought this free and open source project, and based on that, due to the added control which they have over this product which they're getting, which they, they, they could be getting for free, and they could also be getting a similar project by pay, product for, by paying for it, but it wouldn't make any sense to pay for a proprietary project, a product simply because then they can no longer adapt it to their needs. They can no longer hire external people or have a subscription-based model where they can ask the company for features and so on. So they have been able to get this product and then to develop it into a very specialized version of this product, which is called the Science Cloud, which uh, provides computational power to researchers at the university and also the ETH in Zurich. I personally use it, some of my colleagues use it, and it's highly performing, and it is an infrastructure which we would have had no hope of getting under a proprietary business model, where the company would have had to buy a product which they can't really change, like where the University of Zurich would have had to buy a product which they can't really change, and what's the interest that the company behind such a product would see that the research academic market is so big that they develop a specialized product for that? Well, the chances are pretty much null. So you can't stack up your own efforts on top of proprietary software, which is why, it makes it so, uh, which is why free and open source software is so much more interesting for institutions which want to develop highly specialized software for which they have excellent in-house support. Google? and a number of other businesses, while they might not be primarily a free and open source business, are using free and open source software. And sometimes are also distributing it, right? Uh, these are the, this is the popular Chrome uh, browser, which you might be using. And this is the equally, no, actually a tiny bit less popular Chromium browser, uh, which is simply the free and open source version of the Chrome browser. So what Google did is they developed this browser and they released the source code to the community, right? And the community continues to develop this browser, the Chromium browser. They have more eyes, they can find more bugs, they can make it better. And from time to time, Google takes a dip back in here, takes the code out and integrates it into their product, in which they also have other bits of code. Uh, this is very good simply because it gives the community a highly performant um, 
browser to use and to develop. It gives them access to the in-house work done by Google, uh, but it also allows Google to, over time, profit from the work which the community does. Uh, this is a very interesting case because it also exemplifies how important um, non-viral licensing is, right? If this were licensed under the GPL, under the GNU public license, then Google would not be able to do what they're doing now. Then they might not have released the code to begin with, right? So if you're thinking, if at the beginning when I was telling you about the like two different positions in the free and open source world and about the different licenses, if, if at that point you thought, well, of course we have to make sure that everybody forever stays free, well, think about the fact that if we would have done that, you might not have been getting either of these. Other businesses which use free and open source as their main business model um, exist, for instance, Red Hat. Red Hat was one of the first, actually the first company to go public, like on the stock market, under a free and open source business model, where they actually sell subscriptions and subscription-based products and support. They have a very diverse business model. They've been founded in, 19, uh, in 1993. And if you look at the beta of their stock price, for instance, this, this indicates a bit how volatile the stock prices are. You will notice that they are more volatile, but they are still highly correlated with the software market in general, and that they are not that much more volatile than, for instance, proprietary companies, meaning that the company is behaving more or less like a normal software company. Free and open source works for businesses, and it's been working for over two decades. Uh, their products, I've talked to you about OpenStack, they do similar things with Red Hat Enterprise Linux and uh, Cloud Forms, which is sim simply like a meta manager for uh, different cloud computing platforms such as Amazon's Elastic Computing and so on. Um, it's a very good example how you can put together the bits and pieces of the free and open software world and develop a new, more avant-garde, more radical, more volatile business model than just selling software, you know? Another big section of the users and the developers of free and open source software are the people who are susceptible to being persecuted, right? Uh, this, this is like a twofold thing simply because people who are susceptible to being persecuted might be prevented from contributing to free and open source projects and they might also be uh, prevented from using, so to say, a lot of the software infrastructure to conduct their communication and so on. Uh, I've told you about the open source principles, which are 10 in number and which are, are linked at the end. Uh, principle number five is no discrimination against persons or groups, right? You might be reading this and again get a slightly distorted connotation, namely the way in which you hear no discrimination in, in public discourse today. This is not about putting groups of people against each other and making sure that there is social justice and so on. This is something a lot more fundamental. This is not about the people, this is about the software. If you want your software to be as good as possible, and if you do believe that more eyes means less bugs and more features and higher quality and more rapid development, then you want to make sure that everybody can contribute to it. Yeah? This, this doesn't just include people who you might have some resentment on based on their like social group, but this might include people who, for instance, are whistleblowers, right? In a company, someone who has blown the whistle on your product because your product is doing something very bad will very likely no longer be allowed to contribute to that project. That, that's fairly simple logic. In the free and open source software, I dare say this is the kind of people you want on your project, right? Uh, marginalized regimes, you might think that people, simply because they have political opinions which are not, not yours or they are part of a regime or a political system which might be an enemy to yours, should not contribute to a software product simply because they, have, they might have malicious intent. That's not an argument. Everybody has to be able to contribute and they have to be judged on the quality of their contributions. Uh, this of course extends to criminals which many people might have a, a genuine resentment towards, but Nothing which you might ever do should be able to prohibit you from contributing to free and open source software. Equally, not from using it, right? And this is the logo of Tor. How many of you know what Tor is? Wow, very few people buying their drugs online this year. Okay, so Tor is an anonymity network which basically allows you to communicate with other people in what, what many people still believe is the best level of anonymity you can presently reach on the internet, right? And this is very important precisely for people who might 
rightfully, but also otherwise be marginalized, right? Free speech is a right, and free and open source software often in such forms, but also others, allows people to continue having access to this right. And again, you might think, well, I'm not someone who's a criminal. I, I'm not part of a marginalized regime. I'm not a political activist. I've never blown the whistle on anything. Should I ever care? And the question is, maybe you might not want to care right now, but ask yourself, am I the kind of person who is intelligent, creative enough, who might end up having a different position from like some societal mainstream at some point? Are you someone who might end up in these positions at any point? Are you someone who might be wrongfully accused of having committed a crime, right? And if you're not 100% sure certain that that is not the case, then this might also be for you, because you might not be persecuted now, but you want people who are persecuted now to have access to more freedoms, and if it should ever hit you in the future, you definitely want to be able to maintain your freedoms. And of course, you, right? You are, ag again, as I speculated, probably students. You are probably quite creative. You do have the ambition of learning more in your life, of achieving something either academically or professionally. And if you don't have that ambition, you might still be very ha happy if it just happens. And that's something which might actually happen to you if you delve into this world and simply let the entire knowledge permeate into you simply by, by using free and open source products over time. Uh, the sooner you start, the better, right? You might think if you're already a bit older, well, I mean, okay, this is too old now, I can't learn it. I heard that people cannot learn languages after a certain age. Uh, and if we're talking, of course, also a bit about programming languages, and that's very, very wrong. This is entirely not like learning a language, right? You might, there might be things like programming languages, which you don't need to learn to benefit from the advantages of free and open source software. But even if you decide to do that, the syntax and the vocabulary they have is incomparably smaller and more simple than, than a natural language. This is not something which, reasonably speaking, your mind might actually atrophy and be unable to do. You can always do it, but always ask yourself, will it be easier for me today or tomorrow? And very often the reply is, well, it's going to be easier for you today, not least of all, because if you do it today, you will get to reap the benefits for a longer period of time. Uh, participating not only to this course, but to all of the Linux days, all of our events, is less time expenditure than one credit point, right? I'm, I'm certain I am not overselling this when I'm telling you that if you do participate, which I wholeheartedly recommend you do, this will be the most valuable 0 0.9 credit points which you will do in your entire course, right? You get a lot from your time expenditure. And the best thing of all is you've already started, right? You've already attended over an hour of explanation on free and open source software. The information is, free in is, uh, is fresh in your heads. What better time to go forward and build on that than this week and next week, right? Uh, what can you do? Well, first of all, you can stick around and ask and talk to me and, and of course, to the other wonderful people from the alternative in our Q&A round. Uh, you can come to the next Linux Day events, which are available on that website as a listing, and you can join the next Stammtisch. Uh, some of us regularly meet um, in order to like discuss issues associated with free and open source software to offer support uh, to people who might just start using it or who have been using it for a long time but want to find out something new. Uh, as I've told you, free and open source software is very community-based, and there is a community here in Zurich, and we're, of course, very happy to see new faces and, and old faces. Um, if you're interested in these slides, uh, you can get the PDF from here. Of course, PDF is a binary format. It's compiled after a fashion. So if you're interested on the source code of these presentations, maybe because you want a good example for LaTeX, which is something I've told you you might want to be using instead of, uh, of uh, Office Suites, you might see that under this link. Uh, the license is uh, Creative Commun Commons Attribution Sharealike for the reasons which I've mentioned to you before. Uh, and I'd like to say thanks to Cedric, who at some point made a preliminary version of these slides. This is the uh, reference to the open source initiative and their definition of open source, uh, the list of 10 points, which I told you about. And uh, this is the end of the presentation, it says. OK, so I'd be uh, happy to conclude this.
course, not really to conclude this, to move on to the Q&A round. So any questions? <laughs> Why is Munich considering to get out of uh, open free software? Really? Yeah. Well, well that was in the newspaper. Okay. okay. After six or eight years. Okay. okay. Uh, it's in the newspaper, so it must be true. I don't want to cast any, I don't want to cast any doubt on that. It may very well be true, but uh, the fact in question is that I don't know anything about that. If any of the helpers do, I, I would like to hand it to them. Okay, so one popular reason why institutions might want to discontinue their usage of free and open source software is that they find out they are, um, the people who work with them are either too apathetic, disinterested uh, in, in this platform, they are unable to get good support, and their usage is so rudimentary that uh, they are willing to like uh, just risk it and go with the proprietary software model simply to not need to have any additional support and things like that. But it's an argument which I've heard very, very rarely and actually only at the beginning, like in the early, from the early 90s, of course, I was not hearing much at that point um, about free and open source software and I would have thought that would have changed. I actually don't know what's going on in Munich, but uh, yeah, I guess uh, I can't tell you much about that. But I yeah. What I read in the newspaper about this is that uh, part of the people were still using Windows and part were using Linux, and so they had issues with compatibility. And the other point is that um, moving from, is that some people had real difficulties in moving from a pro Windows software to proprietary, uh, to open source software okay. on Linux. So that, that might be a very good argument. The way sometimes people feel reluctant about using free and open source software is if they're in an environment where everybody else doesn't and they feel pressured for compatibility of, or other reasons to stick around with the norm. I think that's a very insidious process by which uh, com proprietary software companies might keep their user base simply by, for instance, what they tend to do in lots of educational areas, get the people hooked on their software and then hope that the environmental constraint will provide, prevent people from using better products. For instance, I see it myself as a scientist. I use Python for most of my scientific computing. In some groups, many people are so entrenched in MATLAB that simply they dismiss anything else simply for like very generic, ill-defined compatibility reasons. It might be that, though again, I, I haven't read that specific article. Um, I'm curious to know more about how free and open source software is financed. Can you give some yeah. you know, case examples there? The, the ways to finance it is very diverse. Um, so, for instance, the BSD license, the Berkeley Software Distribution, and the MIT license, which are actually quite similar, uh, the licenses themselves and the initial software products were built around government grants. And that's why they also had an entirely different incentive, so to say, to stay free and open source, simply because the government grant mandated it. So that's one, one way they get financed, via the government. But I dare say by now that's actually a minimum. Very often, they also get financed by companies who need either a stable backbone for their server, like a very good product, which they run to, to give you software as a service or simply to show you websites, or they simply want to make the support for something a lot better so that more people will be able to buy and use their software. Very many big companies, including IBM and Google, hire people and pay them exclusively to work on free and open source products. So simply to work on things which the company doesn't directly sell, but the existence of this product, these products in a free and open source environment makes the company's position and possibility to sell other products much more stronger. And I think this has grown a lot. Not least of all, very often people contribute to it without being paid. And you might think this is an unsustainable model or this is bad, but it's not really. Very often when you solve a bug, when you're like a proficient computer user, if even not really that proficient, I, I have no formal training as a programmer, right? But when I address a bug in a data analysis kit which I'm using, very often I'm not doing it for the community per se. I'm doing it for me because I want the thing to work, right? And I contributed back to the community simply because that makes my fix more sustainable. It gets permanently included in the software, right? And I also want other people to do the same. So very many contributions are actually personal contributions, which you do simply the way you would be improving anything else in your life. Yeah. Um, how do you like bring your code back, your new like in, uh, improved code back into the community? Like, is it a system or a, a website or? 
So there, there are very many systems, and there have been many throughout the years. Uh, very many of these systems are based around version control. Yeah? Uh, version control simply means that you can track what was edited when, and this is a very good system in which to collaborate because you want to be able to know who contributed what when so that things don't get jumbled. Uh, the presently most popular content management system is a uh, versioning system, sorry, is Git. Um, and there are very many platforms using it in order to allow open source projects to collaborate and further develop. One of the most popular of these is GitHub. So most often you will find a free and open source project which you think is interesting or which somebody has told you about, maybe the ones which I've listed for you. And you can look them up on Google and very often you will get a GitHub address for that, for that product. Where you can log in, you can clone it, get your own copy, do some edits and then ask the owners to pull your edits back. This is a very transparent process. Uh, if you're interested, I can actually show you a bit of it. Are you interested? You want to see it? Okay, that's very great. Uh, so this is, is this Git? Yes, this is Git. See, I was doing just that. So this is how the interface works. This is a project which I've told you about, NiPipe, which allows you to concatenate functions from other which might not even be, be that free uh, data analysis pipelines into a Python-based pipeline. Uh, and here you can see, for instance, the code of the project, right? These are like the, the folders, the Docker image examples of how to use the code. This is a readme telling you something about the code. This is a continuous integration check to make sure that the, the, co the code isn't broken. And for instance, these are the pull requests. These are people who have, who want something to be added and they made a pull request. For instance, they want to improve readability of the model gen examples, right? And this, this, is, uh, this is what he did. These are the commits which he added and to, 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 uh, these are the files he he's changed. So you can see exactly with green what was added and with red what was deleted. And people can reply to this and reach a conclusion whether they want to merge it or not, right? Uh, so this is how it works. It's a very simple, very transparent interface, which makes it difficult to like cheat or include things which shouldn't be included. So the owner or like the original um, developer does uh, review the new code and then integrate it. Like it depends a lot on the developer and the project. Some people might want to keep their projects very like close to themselves, so they like stay the main developer, but. Experience shows that once your project gets big enough, that's not a good strategy simply because you don't have the time to review like the thousands of pull requests a week which you get for a big project like the Linux kernel. So very often as your project gets bigger and you have more contributors, you will find out whom can I trust and you will also give those people permission to be able to decide whether something would be included or not. Yeah. Uh, maybe one thing uh, actually reporting about is already considered uh, a contribution. Because when you, if you complain that something is not working, actually you discovered it, which is a lot of work in programming. And so when they when they fix it, they don't just do it for you, but they do it also for their product. So when you go and say, hey, this is not working, I'm doing this and that, it crashes, that is already a contribution, even if you have absolutely no technical understanding. Yeah. Uh, is, this, is this the GitHub issue? Yes, this is a GitHub issue tab. So in the GitHub issue tab, you can simply report an issue, something you didn't understand, something you think may be wrong, and, and the, the owners will see it. Of course, there's other ways to report these things, but since everything's on GitHub, very many people do it here. There used to be bug trackers like Bugzilla, and again, you don't have to be a very high level programmer to do that. Most of the code, especially in Python, is fairly easy. It's a bit similar to English, except it's a lot easier to learn. and. Uh, you, if you already know English, then you might be looking at the examples, and if you're a new user and you find the examples unclear, for instance, this was exactly the pull request I talked to you about, right? This guy was well, com noticed that the, the, the examples were not very readable, so he decided to do something very simple, probably, to reformat and reword them in a way which, uh, which makes the examples more accessible to people. So regardless your level of technical knowledge, it's very easy to get involved, and each time you get involved, you get a tiny bit technically more savvy. And it's like a slippery slope, except it's going upwards, you know? And you slip upwards. As I told you, I'm not trained as a programmer. I, I started using Python to do some 
data analysis for my bachelor's thesis, and without even realizing it, I ended up becoming quite good and doing a lot of coding. And uh, this is actually the story of very many people, especially in the academic world. You mentioned several examples of free nodes or software. Are there any disadvantages? And if yes, which one do you see? Okay. Uh, it depends for whom. So disadvantages for the user? Uh, yes, okay. Good question. Um, uh, yes, but I, I guess, guess you mean disadvantages for the user. So one thing which is notable, and if so, and some of you might stumble upon, especially if you want to use this brilliant opportunity of the Linux days to have someone help you install Linux on your own machine, right? Because that's what we're doing, and a whole lot more. Uh, then you might stumble across the fact that if you have a very new machine, right? which is like made by a company which tries to keep the drivers proprietary and so on, some features on your machine might not be very well supported. Simply because they are very new, they are not open source, and the open source world can't really figure out that fast how to interact with them. For instance, this laptop, back when it was new, quite a few years ago, I had, it took me a while until I got the multi-touch working on the trackpad, right? Uh, by now it works, but if you have a very new product, you might have a bit of speed bumps. Uh, depending on, on how much you rely on these extra features, because it's usually extra features which don't work, this might either be a deal breaker for you, or you might say, well, it doesn't really matter. The, the benefits far outweigh this temporary and small cost. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how about open uh, uh, Open source software for so smartphones. Yeah, this is a very interesting point. Uh, most smartphones, at least like the Android phones, they use the Linux kernel, or actually a patched version of the Linux kernel, which is reasonably free and open source. A number of other applications on them might be free and open source or might not be free and open source. Generally, however, the environment is still tightly controlled by the companies who make them. The, Definitely on iOS, but also in Android to some regard, simply because the entire Java mess of dependencies which you have on the, on the phone is either unclear or not free and open source to begin with, which actually makes these platforms quite insecure. Uh, very many people have been hoping for a long time to get like a phone which is entirely free and open source so that you can stop worrying about what, what people who might have an exploit or what people who might want to surveil you are doing on it. But sadly, that's not really happening. So it's a bit difficult, but uh, we'll get there eventually. It's just not happening right now. Yeah? I think the problem is the people are lazy because I know Android and it's well, this means that you don't have to really much music. Uh, yeah. yeah, you have to look a little bit and learn something. And, and well, it didn't change for six, nine, eight years. Um. Well, I mean, that's a good point. But then again, if you look at, at most like free and open source operating systems on your desktop, it's not like so many fundamental things have changed. So like the continuity is there everywhere. And I guess what, what you actually mean when you're referring to this is that this is like a considerably more low level platform. You don't have like a terminal. You can't type in this is a different type of interface, which I guess is one of the limiting factors. But I wouldn't blame it on free and open source software requiring you to learn a lot. And I wouldn't even blame it at, at being like stupid or, or for people who are stupid. Uh, I wouldn't say that. Uh, I, I'd simply say that it's an environment which uh, was developed very rapidly, pushed forward by companies, but with the interest to have a certain control over it. Uh, I think with time, this will definitely work out. Uh, one problem which, which might be more serious and related to what you said is I think it's called TiVoization. It's uh, a practice by which a company distributes software to you on a physical device, but doesn't really let you modify it, right? Um, and it, it's a bit of an insidious way to organize like this control over you because quite often it might even be free and open source software, which they simply distribute in such a way with modifications that you cannot undo those modifications. But for instance, the newest GPL has provisions against that, so people who use any sort of GPL3 license code will not be able to do that. So it's an ongoing fight, especially like at the cutting edge of devices, not at the cutting edge of technology. 
classical computer technology is uh, mastered and championed by free and open source software. But I think in this area, some people might still try to be getting a bit more control. But I think it won't work out, and with time, we will have Linux phones, yeah? Yeah? So you mentioned you listen to music. Uh, yes. I'm using uh, open source software. And you want to listen to it right now? Ah, I don't have a headphone jack here. Yeah. <laughs> I also heard you say that uh, you don't pay for it. Yes. So that leads me to the question, how do artists get paid for the work they do? Okay, so I, I'm, I'm, I might have paid for the music when I bought it. Uh, the question was that I'm not paying for listening to it, right? And very often in these, uh, in these like models where you simply buy a cloud subscription and you get the music from Apple or, or Google and so on, you do end up paying for that entire system, right? Um, however, the same thing which applies to the technological world, namely that free and open source does hold the product to a higher standard, and people have to go to that standard, but that also pushes the entire field forward, I think also applies to art. Especially in, uh, in Eastern Europe, where um, either the legal protection or simply the power of like big uh, media publishers to, to sue people and to shut down people who are selling their artist music, who are distributing their artist music for free was not as high as in the West. Very many artists have adapted to this business model and they have created websites where they share their music for free, they themselves, right? Because as an artist, you kind of want to do that, right? Because you want people to listen to your music, you want people to get hooked on your music, you want people to become your groupies, and you want people to pay a lot of money to go to your concerts, right? So I think that this proprietary art form world is more an artifact of like big media companies owning the business of the artists and trying to put up a front in which you need to go through them to get to the artist, because they take care of publicity for the artists, right? But if the artist tries to connect directly with you, then he has to make publicity for himself. And the best way to make publicity for himself is to give you his work for free, at least part of it, and make you very interested in it, right? If you have music which you can download for free and music which you can pay for, which will be easier, faster, and cheaper to get? The answer is a no-brainer. And if there are very many artists, whose music will you end up listening to? I guess the one which you might get for free. This also addresses the question of how come I don't have to pay for, for listening to music, simply because many of those artists actually make it available for free. Okay. I know my band too, and they actually said it's too expensive for them to sell their music. So they would pay more than they would get, that's why they just give it away for free. But with all the licensing fees, etc., it's just when you're small, you cannot make money out of your music. Th that's a very good point, and it's the same thing I mentioned when I said freer than the free market, right? The free market might be more free than like a government-sponsored program, right, and have more competition, but still it has a lot of overhead, and it has a lot of hurdles to competition simply because you have to go through lawyers, through patents, through distributors. If you can com compete at the level of the product, then that will make it far more easier for talented people to get into the field, distribute their product, and, and it will also lead to the best product being distributed, not to the one which might play and interact best with like this corporate infrastructure. But you still don't answer my question. Maybe? My question is, will the blockchain solve the financing question? Will the, the, sorry, though? The blockchain, will that solve the financing question? I mean, musicians also have to buy a grocery. What, what do you mean by the blockchain? The blockchain. That as I understand, no. it enables people to easily uh, pay. Ah, okay. I, yeah, that, that's a different thing. That's like a, a, mi a micro payment or like this this Bitcoin payment system. Yeah. Th this, this is something different entirely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But if if your question still remains, where do artists get their money, is from different business models, which very often rely on them getting money from concerts. Okay. Do you feel like some of the reasons which are applied, for example, for freedom of use in Jor could be applied for, for example, freedom of carrying a gun? And I mean, like many people agree that carrying a gun should be prohibited. And I, I walk around in Zurich often, and I see people with guns. I walk around in Zurich often, and I see people with guns. But many people, I mean, for many people, it's reasonable some limitation should be there, or for example, distributing of drugs. Well, you might, so yeah, 
to address your, sorry, go on, I'll, I'll answer at the end, yeah. Yeah, so you're presenting us proprietary software as some kind of evil, isn't it like much more complicated than that? No, so I mean, I, I think these are like two separate issues. The first one is communication and free speech is considered a right in most countries in the world, right? This is something you want people to have. Carrying a gun is considered a right in some countries of the world, but not in all of them. So I think that's where that particular analogy breaks apart. If we would be having this discussion, for instance, in, in a US American context, where very many people might feel very strongly about carrying their guns, then uh, the, the sentiment regarding your example might be a different one. Uh, regarding selling and buying drugs, uh, yes, that is a regulated uh, area. Some, some of those things are illegal. But the problem is once you have the infrastructure to deny people to do things which are illegal in the sense of communicating information which might have something to do with drugs, then it becomes a very fuzzy area towards the point when you can use that power to deny people to do all sorts of stuff. It's very good that there is an infrastructure which does not allow anybody, regardless of how noble their cause is or how noble they say their cause is, to interfere with your basic freedoms. I think that that's a very good point, and that's why Tor, I think, continues to be very valuable, right? But isn't it like even the people who are fighting against rights, they mm -hmm. sometimes overuse their power, and we're aware of it, but we still agree that even though we have some disadvantages, we support those people, and we support wow. the idea that... You, you may support them, other people may not support them, but that's more of a political and less of a technological discussion, right? People who fight against drugs can also fight against the spread of drugs using Tor, right? They can set up honeypots and try to attract sellers. The question which we are addressing here is that you have an infrastructure which makes it impossible or at least very, very hard for a set of basic freedoms, including speech and communication, to be denied to you for whatever reason. And I think no matter how much you stand by the, the people who are fighting against drugs and against all other sorts of criminality, you, mi you might agree that this never or seldomly puts it in a position where it is at all justified to strip you of your basic freedoms, right? I think um, we're talking about a model that does not consider good or bad, just guarantees those freedoms. So it's not necessarily a question about judging what is a good freedom, what is a bad freedom, which freedom we're supposed to give. It's just about everything. And uh, whether or not uh, this is actually good or bad depends on political position that you have. I mean, uh, if you go uh, east, you will find many countries who have limited access <coughs> to some websites that here we consider perfectly normal, such as Facebook, such as uh, even YouTube, uh, with the, I think about two years ago in Turkey. Uh, and the thing is that these technologies makes it harder or even impossible for governments to just arbitrarily prohibit people from visiting that kind of website. Of course, that can be misused, but this is not a technological question. This is a, a question about morality. Yeah, but for example, like in China, you have this firewall which is actually working, and people have no access to this website. And it feels like it is like that because, I mean, like in Russia, it doesn't work because it's not economically justified. There but I, I reason why. Again, I, I guess you are you are like drifting off into a political niche, which is of course very interesting and which I think some of us here do have strong opinions on. But this is not a matter of technology, right? Free and open source is simply about giving people the power to have as many liberties as possible, right? And you might think, well, that's against the law and so on. Well, very often the law is not one step ahead, but one step behind morality. And if you look at morality, very often morality is not one step ahead of technology, but one step behind it, right? So we're two steps ahead of the law. Not that we're doing something illegal, but this is shaping the world of possibilities of tomorrow to which our, mo to which our morals will, will then apply and to which then the laws will apply. This is an entirely different concept, simply about setting up a world in which it is more difficult to create barriers and to prohibit cooperation and progress, including and especially in the area of software development. Uh, but uh, if, if you're still interested in, in the political issue, we're, we're not really a political organization, but you can show up at the Stammtisch and, and talk to us more about it. I'm sure we have a lot of opinions on that.
and I asked a question about um, this open and free use of where in embedded systems or also Internet of Things, also especially for the safety concerns they have. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is the TiVoization I told you about. So very, very often companies might want to sell you like a smart TV manager, which they pack full of open source software because that's what perf it's performing well. And then they add some proprietary add-ons to it or like they pipe your data around and do things which you may or may not want done, but they don't give you any way to like change it or they have like bootloaders which like only load stuff which they have the checksums inside for. So weird stuff. Um, I, I guess the question is, this can become a problem, but the GPL license vers version 3 fights against it, so it, it might be less of a problem or more of a problem. In the past, one thing we know is that if it becomes more of a problem, there will be more efforts from the free and open source um, community to curb that. Uh, ideally, embedded systems are not so much more different from other kinds of systems. It's just that they're very specialized. And just like he said about the phones, if like the user, face, user interface or the amount of things you can do is smaller, then it becomes easier for companies to put a brick wall in between you and the, the computation, right? I mean, that brick wall might be a layer of plastic and, and no connectors to edit it, but that, that's enough to like restrict the freedom of very many people. Yeah. And as the company, if I turn on Android, talk to smartphones, that's a very interesting thing. You, there might have been a contract. I don't know if there might have been a contract. You might lose warranty of the product, and there, there are like modified versions of the Android kernel and so on. Um, do, do you know anything about this? Yeah. yeah uh, on a Sony smartphone, um, there is a possibility to unlock your phone so that it will boot something else than the system that is on it. Um, but I don't, I don't have any proof for this, but this is what I've heard and read. So I'm not perfectly sure, but I think this is the way it is. If you do that, there will be physically on a chip on the phone a code, a secret code deleted. And you need that, uh, that code in order to access some device functions. Rumors say that the camera will get much worse because there's some really Sony specific camera features that enhance the image quality that only work if that code is present. And the camera otherwise will refuse to provide those features. And I've also heard rumors about other phones where suddenly you cannot play certain uh, audio formats, DRM encrypted formats. Um, so that is what the sellers can do, even though they claim that they are perfectly open. Again, without any guarantees. So as with DRM and tvoization and other technologies, companies have tried to curb the, the freedom inherent in free and open source software because they want to benefit from the advantages they have, but they still want to have like more power in their relationship with their users. Um, but I think at some point they will have to ask themselves, is it really cost efficient to spend so much time and legal energy on restricting freedom? Why don't I make the next step to a more advanced, uh, more modern, or potentially more powerful business model. I think it's a enhance if you control the system. So you can say, so for this model, we give a new uh, backup and some ads like what and Facebook uh, ads you see what you need. And they say, no, for Android uh, 5.0, we don't uh, give the backup. And I mean, you can. You can, you can try. You can try, but in the end, that might create uh, discontent with your customers, and that might actually motivate the market to produce uh, other products, right? So I mean, uh, but this is another thing. It's not just about motivating the market to produce other products, right? Uh, a thing which I heard Richard Stallman say, which uh, he might not have thought about. Uh, thought of himself is that a choice of masters is not freedom, right? That's why it's more important with free and open source software, you don't just get the choice between different companies which may or may not satisfy your freedom and information needs, but simply you get direct access to the software. You can modify it. You don't like get to choose between five different people who offer to modify it for you, right? No other questions? Okay, we were kind of enjoying this. Okay, we've had a lot of questions from there, no, no questions from this area? No? Okay. Uh, then that's great. It was really nice to have you here. I hope you will attend the rest of the Linux days and uh, that we might see some of you at the Stammtische. We're very happy to uh, accompany you on, on this journey and uh, teach you as much as possible about Linux and how to use it and how to make it work for your very specific use case.
And there's free beer. <laughs> Apparently there's also that, yeah. <laughs> so there's not just free as in free speech here, but also free as in free beer. So the full package. <laughs>